What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 41 of Preloaded. My name is Josh Finderup, and I am joined, as always, by the other half of Preloaded, Jackson Vanover. How are you doing this week, Jackson? I'm doing great, Josh. Um, I was going to say this is the calm before the storm, but I, I think the storm's kind of already arrived. We've gotten so much news going on, um, so I'm really excited to get into it. Yeah, the end of last week and the very beginning of this week uh, was pretty quiet, but then yesterday and today we got a uh, yeah, we did get a bit of a storm of news. Uh, we got a bunch of E3 scheduling stuff, uh, so we're going to get into that. And we got a bunch of PlayStation news, uh, specifically some stuff about Horizon and God of War. So uh, very interesting stuff. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about that. Stay tuned for all of that. We also have a deep dive discussion this week that uh, we're going to get into some of our most underrated games or underappreciated games of all time. So if any of that sounds interesting... Stick around, it's going to be a good show, but first, you can catch Preloaded. We post it every Friday over on Jackson's YouTube channel. He's J-V, J-A-Y-V-E-E -E on YouTube, so subscribe there if you haven't already. Or, if you prefer to listen, you can catch the audio version uh, on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or Stitcher. And if you are listening on any of those platforms, we'd love for you to leave a review, drop a five-star review, or even a written review and that'll help us uh, grow our audience. And uh, if you want to write into Preloaded, you can also do that at the email address preloadedpodcast at gmail.com. We dig into our mailbag at the end of every show. So if there's something you want to hear us discuss, uh, send us an email, and we will look forward to reading your messages. And with that, all that out of the way, we are going to kick the show off as we always do with our segment what the hell have you been playing, Jackson? So this week, Josh, more Mass Effect 2 from me. Um, I really haven't um, sunk in my teeth into anything else. I did fire up Battlefield, kind of getting hyped for the Battlefield reveal nice. um, next week. So that was kind of exciting. But yeah, mostly Mass Effect 2. And uh, I probably sound like a broken record this is, you know, one of my favorite franchises ever, and Mass Effect 2 is just, um, by many accounts, a perfect game, and that's what I'm, <laughs> you know, encountering once again, yeah. so it's just been great. Very cool, yeah. I thought about getting into the Mass Effect trilogy, but it just wasn't seeming to, you know, wasn't the itch I was hoping to scratch, so I finished Biomutant. I'm going to talk about that more at the end of the show but uh, I also started a game called Aragami, which I'm sure many people know. It's an indie game. It's uh, it's another stealth game. I wanted more stealth, so uh, <laughs> I got into that. And you know, this game is it's really fun. It's uh, it's it's like if Dishonored was purely stealth, no action, and it was ninjas instead of the kind of steampunk or whale punk, whatever you call it. Um, so you're this ninja. You can teleport around just like in Dishonored. You have that. It's like a blink ability from Dishonored. And uh, then you get these other supernatural abilities that you can use to stealth around and take people out. So I'm having a great time with that. Cool, man. That looks really cool. Yeah, yeah. And they just announced a sequel. Well, they, they just revealed the release date for the sequel, which I think comes out in September. So I'm kind of trying to catch up because I would like to play that. Perfect timing. Yep. So uh, that's what we've been playing. We are now going to get into the big stories of the week. And the first one that we are going to cover uh, is the Battlefield 6 reveal that Jackson mentioned earlier. So this is coming on June 9th. So uh, barring anybody else announcing a big event or reveal sooner, this is uh, going to be, I think, the first big event of, of E3 proper where EA yeah, reveals uh, Battlefield 6. I don't think they showed anything other than that kind of uh, turquoise blue teaser on Twitter where it just had the word Battlefield. So not even Battlefield 6. And by the way, this happens at 10 a.m. Eastern, um, 7 a.m. Pacific on June 9th. And I'm, I i don't know if, uh, yeah, I guess it's Battlefield's YouTube channel. But uh, any, did they reveal anything else about this, Jackson? No, I don't think so. Um, and that's been curious to me too. Like I was thinking maybe they'd give us a snippet of gameplay to sort of wet our appetites uh but but no this this is literally it so uh just the announcement that there will be a trailer uh is what we have now and i just hope they go back to a modern era i'd be really really excited to play that game yeah and there has been there have been some rumors swirling around battlefield and i know there have been some call of duty ones so i don't want to get them mixed up 
Uh, was Call of Duty the one that they said might be a World War II ish? Oh gosh, setting? I think I think, I think so. it was. I think yeah. so. Yeah, so I, I don't know if we know or have any hints or leaks about where Battlefield or when Battlefield might take place. But anyway, we'll all find out on June 9th. Yeah, I'm excited to find out. I don't think it'll be World War II just because Battlefield Five was World War II. So it'd be f- kind of weird for them to do the same setting two years in a row or two times in a row. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it would. So uh, uh, after that, we're going to get into the next story is the ESA released the full schedule for E3 2021. Uh, and it goes June 12th through June the 15th. So I'm going to just rattle off real quickly kind of the big high, the headliners here. This is not everything, but these are the ones that uh, you definitely don't want to miss if you're busy during these days. Uh, try and at least catch these. So June 12th, uh, Gearbox Entertainment and Ubisoft have their big shows. Uh, I'm definitely looking forward to Ubisoft, see what they show off there. June 13th, uh, the big one and maybe the biggest of the entire show of E3 is Microsoft and Bethesda. I believe that one's in the morning. And then we have Square Enix Presents, so we'll probably see some exciting stuff there. The PC Gaming Show, uh, which has become a a tradition at E3 now. And then uh, Warner Brothers has their uh, show, which... I don't think is the same as like DC Fandom. That's different. Um, but Warner Brothers will have a show on the on the 13th. And then uh, Back for Blood is having its own presentation. Yeah, it was interesting on, I was just reading the press release and they, they coupled those together. They did like a Warner Bros. Games and a Back for Blood. So huh. I don't, are, is that, uh, is Warner Bros. publishing Back for Blood? I actually don't know the answer to that question. I do not know either. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, maybe it is, and that would definitely be a big one for Warner Brothers to show off. I know a lot of people are looking forward to that. Also in Warner Brothers, you know, there's uh, Harry Potter and then uh, the two uh, DC Comics games, which I really hope we at least see uh, uh, Gotham Knights. Yeah, keep keep your tabs on this show. They have some big games, just like Josh said. Yep. Uh, so that's just the first two days. Then on June 14th, there's Take Two. Uh, which you know they have a ton of stuff. I you know I don't expect to see anything from Rockstar, but definitely 2K might show some stuff. Um, so that could be interesting. And how does that work with Gearbox? Because doesn't Gearbox get published by 2K? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, Gearbox Entertainment, uh, I believe, is the developer, and then there's Gearbox Publishing, which okay. does their own thing. I think they're relatively new to the game, so. Uh, I think take two, that'll be where we see um, like Borderlands, but Gearbox Entertainment will be where we see the uh, the publishing side of things, unless I'm wrong. Yeah, and maybe, fingers crossed, I mean, this could be a big high hopes thing, but maybe uh, Bioshock. Oh, I, I, I have <laughs> seen some rumors that we're going to see Hangar 13's project. Um, Very cool. So we'll have to see. Yeah, um, and then next on June 14th, we get Capcom. Have no idea what uh, they are going to show there, even though I feel like I should know what we're going to see there. Um, And then on June 15th, uh, we have Bandai Namco is going to have a show. I'm not sure. Are they, is that the, is that who is doing, um, who's publishing Elden Ring? Is that Bandai Namco? Oh gosh, that's a really good question because they're working with FromSoft, obviously. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do a quick, yes, that's right. So maybe if, if uh, Elden Ring gets shown, maybe that's where we'll see it. Uh, But then. Uh, a big one got announced uh, June 15th is also Nintendo's uh, showcase. It's, it's going to be a Nintendo Direct, and uh, we do have some more details on this one in particular because there are all those rumors swirling around the uh, the next Nintendo Switch or the Nintendo Switch Pro, whatever they call that. Uh, so this is happening on June 15th. It will be roughly 40 minutes and focused exclusively on what they just say, exclusively Switch games releasing mostly in 2021. And that's kind of significant because uh, some people were speculating that that means when they say mostly Switch games, they some people seem to take that as not Switch Pro games so that this presentation might skew less towards the Nintendo Switch Pro. I didn't take it that way. I do think we're going to see something with the Nintendo Switch Pro or whatever they call it. Uh, did you have any thoughts on that, Jackson? I'd love to see uh, the Nintendo Switch Pro. That's just very exciting, and I think it would be smart to pair that with like Breath of the Wild 2, for example. Yeah. Um, but I, I did kind of read into the, the words here. I, I do think maybe they're trying to temper expectations, but we'll see. Yeah, we will see. Yeah, so it would be cool to see Breath of the Wild 2. Uh, on top of this, there's going to be a three-hour uh, Nintendo Treehouse Live uh, presentation after the Nintendo Direct. And this just made me happy just because it feels like 
E3 of old, even though it's not. <laughs> We're not going to be there. There's not going to be anything in person, but this is what Nintendo always does. So kind of getting back into old habits. Yes, I think so. And just a sidebar here, I was looking, Jason Schreier tweeted this morning, or he has been tweeting over the past few days that not even press really knows what's going on with E3 this year. It seems very disorganized. So don't don't uh, be surprised if this feels more like a scattershot of an event um, over this, you know, these five, four days. Yeah, and like just some behind the curtain stuff, you know, they just opened registration for influencers and media like two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that's like no time at all to like process these applications. I applied. I have no idea if they're going to let me like in on these early days. I think there are a few early days of something that they're going to show. But um, just the fact that it was such a short time frame makes me think that it must be just chaos over there right now. Yeah. Josh and I are used to applying for E3 badges in March just yeah. for context. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Yep. Yeah. So uh, we'll see. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we both get approved and we can you know get some cool content out of it but uh who knows right I, i'm i'm interested to see how it works out yeah so anyway that's the whole e3 uh summer game mess uh, uh situation right now i'm sure more stuff will come out in the in the week ahead uh, i think by the next time we record e3 should be in full swing so exactly so excited for it yeah me too um so uh the next news stories we got are all about uh playstation and and uh the the exclusivity situation over there or not even the exclusivity anyway i'll just get right into it playstation had a uh, a blog post that came out recently i think it was an interview with herman holst who is uh I'm not sure his official title he's you know pretty much the head of things over there and he gave a ton of information about uh new ips uh well i guess their uh the projects they have in development especially horizon forbidden west and god of war and a few others but anyways Horizon Forbidden West is on track, he says, for a holiday season release, but that is not set in stone. And some notable people, like Greg Miller, just flat out don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I, I, I'm a little more optimistic. We'll see. Uh, he also said that, uh, or mentioned, kind of under the radar, they kind of snuck this in anyway. God of War got delayed until 2022. Uh, it is kind of funny if you read the post. That is definitely buried. They buried the lead there, uh, <laughs> understandably so. Uh, also... And I think this is the biggest news that I got out of it. God of War Ragnarok will be a uh, cross-gen game. So it'll be on both PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5, as will Gran Turismo 7, which they actually had previously said that Gran Turismo 7 would be a PlayStation 5 exclusive. Before I move on to the rest of this, any thoughts so far, Jackson? I've been talking for a while. Oh, you're good. Um, Yeah, so the Horizon thing is very interesting. I th I'm in the same boat as you. I'm actually optimistic, um, and, and we'll talk more about Horizon in a second and reasons why it might still be coming this year. You know, people like Greg Miller are not always 100% um, spot on, but um, the fact that these are cross-gen games, I also saw an article today uh, talking about how this was always in the cards. And I've seen a lot of people complain about mixed messaging from Sony and PlayStation about how they're treating generations. Um, yeah. But this just makes sense. There are so many PlayStation 4s out in the wild. I think they're leaving a lot of money on the table and frustrating fans if they make these uh, next gen only. That's just my opinion. Yeah, I think that on the cross gen thing, it doesn't bother me. I don't, I mean, I heard someone say on a different podcast, uh, like, was God of War for the PlayStation 4 in any way? Did it, it did it come up short in any way? No. So I don't expect that God of War 2 or Ragnarok, whatever it's called, just because it's on the PlayStation 4, it's still going to be an amazing game. Um, I'm not too... And yeah, like 100 million PlayStation 4s out there, they'd be crazy not to. Uh, the, only down, the only problem I had is, I, I almost guarantee you, even though I don't know anything, I could be totally wrong here, but... It seems like PlayStation had to have known when they put that 2021 on the reveal of God of War Ragnarok. They had to have known. No way is this game coming out in 2021. Um, yeah, totally. So I wish they would have been a little more straight there. But um, overall, yeah, that doesn't bother me. Just want to get into some other stuff, though, that came out in this blog post. And that is that Sony Bend is developing a new open world game. And it's based on systems that they established in Days Gone, which I found this to be really exciting news. Even though I haven't played Days Gone I certainly want to get to it. It's uh, it, to me looks fantastic. I know a lot of people love it, um, but I don't know if I want another zombie game. So this might actually be like the best case scenario for me, for sure. And and I found I played Days Gone um, for like a year after it came out, and I found it really 
actually refreshing and charming. And I totally get the uh, fatigue for a zombie game. And so those are such talented developers at that studio. So I'm like you. I'm very excited for this game. Yep. Yeah. And so the last thing we got uh, out of this was that uh, to no, I, well, not to my surprise anyway. I wasn't surprised by this. They are going to, or PlayStation is going to release more games on PC. They have been s- successful with that. Uh, I think they have confirmed that the next one is going to be Uncharted 4, I believe. Um, but anyhow, look forward to that. Yeah, just it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was the first bit of PlayStation news we got. The second came out this morning, uh, at least, or maybe it started yesterday. I'm not sure, but. Um, uh, Guerrilla Games released a ton of uh, information about Horizon Forbidden West, and uh, I believe you are uh, maybe, well, I don't want to spoil it, Jackson, I'll just <laughs> kick it over to you. Yeah, so Josh is alluding to the fact I'm working on a video. In fact, it, it'll it be out by the time you guys see this. Um, I'm just cranking out videos these days. It's just working like that. But uh, yeah, so there were three separate sources that I could find for Horizon Forbidden West information. There's a Game Informer, Informer interview with the game's director and narrative director. Then there's an IGN article. And then there is another interview with a French YouTuber who's known for open world games. Um, so essentially, we learned just a laundry list of things. It's kind of an explosion of information. Um, first off, the big one for me is the 60 FPS performance mode. Um, Josh, I'm sure you've seen this horizon is like the big notable exclusive that hasn't gotten a PS five version, uh, that's increased the performance and it's some weird technical issue. So I'm glad to know that they're committed to delivering something that is on the same, uh, technical level as other, uh, exclusives. That's big for me personally. Um, but yeah, is, is that, um, so they're, 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 they're integrating that into forbidden West, but they haven't said they're they're not they're still not uh, integrating that into zero dawn correct that we know of correct right. yeah which is strange uh, maybe they'll surprise us and give us a, a you know an update to tie us over until forbidden west comes out who knows um yeah but yeah just tons of information on like a climbing system they overhauled the skill tree there's new melee combat combos there's a workbench of course, they had the fluffy stuff about uh, being on PlayStation and having the adaptive triggers and whatnot. Um, and then they also commented on the release window and kind of just said, we're going to... They said what Cyberpunk and CDPR said before they were wrong. <laughs> Basically, yeah, they'll release it when it's ready. So yeah. um, I don't know. They just kept saying they're on track and on track means holiday. So I don't know. Until they say something otherwise, I'll sort of believe them yeah yeah i would love to see this game this year and um sony doesn't playstation doesn't always have a big game in the fall or you know late late fall early winter but i i would i would be surprised if this doesn't come out but then again um yeah there i i do actually believe them when they say they're going to release it when it's ready uh playstation has a impeccable track record of releasing very polished games and this is now one of their biggest so i wouldn't expect to see this one until it is very good there's a lot of chips on this one like yep seeing how zero dawn is done um forbidden west has you know the the witcher uh three wild hunt potential i feel like in terms of open world popularity yeah and the one thing i did want to just mention and kind of ask you about how you felt about it like from my impressions of reading the the new content that's out there about the gameplay it seems like the the climbing system isn't exactly what it looked like in the gameplay reveal. Like in the gameplay reveal, they had all those yellow grapple points. But in reading the previews that just came out, it seems like this is going to be much more like Breath of the Wild, where you really can climb. There are going to be these grapple points or climbing points, but you won't always see them. They're just there, and that you'll be able to climb pretty much anywhere unless you're maybe in a uh, like a, a, a camp or something like that. I read um, a little bit from one of these interviews that specifically talked about that and said, yes, you can climb anywhere. Just what was shown in the gameplay was to highlight the fact that you can use your focus Mm -hmm. to show you very specific climbing places that'll get you up most efficiently. Um, So I think we'll see more gameplay that'll show off the fact that this is a free climbing system. And it made me think of Ghost of Tsushima. Ghost of Tsushima is a game where there are specific points that you can only climb on those points. And it feels a little silly, 
Um, I don't think that's what Horizon Forbidden West will be. Yeah, yeah. It seemed uh, like they were definitely providing the player more freedom than we saw, or at least that that it seemed like we saw in the gameplay reveal. So anyway, super exciting stuff. Yeah, go dig it up if you are curious, or uh, actually, better yet, stay tuned to JV's (laughs) YouTube channel. Yes. Uh, Look forward to that. Uh, Cool. So yeah, that's all the news of the week. Uh, We are now going to take our first break, and we are going to get into uh, some underrated games when we get back. We'll see you in just a second. And we're back. We are now going to get into our deep dive discussion, which this week is going to uh, revolve around our top three, each of our top three most underrated or underappreciated games that we have ever played. And uh, this discussion was kind of spurred on by uh, the release of Biomutant, which, um, you know, uh, Jackson reviewed on his channel. And I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Jackson, but at least... It seems like you at least enjoyed that game. Uh, yep. Um, and I loved that game. And uh, so it, I guess I'll kick it off. Biomutant is definitely on my list of the most underrated games that I've ever played. Um, this game, I think it's sitting in between a 60 and 70, somewhere on Metacritic, and I don't know where it is on Open Critic, but it's... Uh, I, I, I would rate this game like an 8 for me personally. And uh, just... I, I loved the open world, the exploration was great um the thing about biomutant is for me if you just stick to the main story i do think the main quest is pretty lackluster the gameplay is not great um the story is kind of interesting but the real uh meat of this game for me was in the side content and just exploring the world the side missions i felt the world was beautiful it was diverse uh you had the you know biomes is kind of the word of the uh day i guess right now but it does have these different biomes that felt really fun to explore uh the writing actually won me over totally won me over uh um how unique it is you you won't find another game that sounds in in terms of writing like biomutant you just won't um very media molecule i guess if there was one developer that's pulled that off anyway i'll stop rambling i love biomutant full yeah man I think that's uh, that's that's something that's going to be on a lot of people people's lists because it does seem like it was a critical failure and uh, this it's definitely going to generate a cult following and I don't mean that in a bad way um, it deserves it uh, very yeah. unique but um, so for mine number one um, sometimes I have a I have a bad memory when I'm trying to think of underrated or just games in general over however many years I've been playing games um, for me it's Battleborn <laughs> which was oh, a game. Yeah. Uh, a Gearbox game that came out uh, right before Overwatch in 2016. And it's a game that I played so much. I was addicted to it. I somehow convinced all of my buddies to get it. And we were like, we would win every game we would play because we were so dedicated. I felt like we were in the top 1% of players, even though there were very few players. Um, And it's rare that a game hooks me like that, but it's also rare that I'm able to ignore the noise. Um, Lots of people can this game for being visually, uh, not disturbing, that's the wrong word, but visually assaulting to the eyes. Just too much flashing and you just don't know what's going on. It's hard to track. It's basically a third-person MOBA-style game like Smite, um, I think is the best comparison. I loved it, and it did the whole hero shooter thing. Um, Just a very unique game from uh, Gearbox, a developer that I really like. And so I dug it. I was really sad to see the way that it turned out and how people pretty much decided to make fun of it um, by the end of it. And so when it died, I uh, was very sad. So that's my number one. (laughs) Yeah, it seems like... uh you know, a lot of companies, when there's a big, uh, a hugely successful game like Overwatch or like League of Legends uh, that's on the service side of things or games as a service side of things, just everybody tries to replicate that. And uh, whether they do a good job or not, it sometimes it doesn't matter because there's just that saturation in the market. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so too bad that it didn't work out for that game. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. So for me, all right, the this was a tough decision because, uh, you know, Ubisoft games get a lot of attention, so calling them underappreciated, I don't think qualifies. But I do think Immortals: Phoenix Rising, I think, didn't get the credit it deserves. Now, this game is very derivative. It's like it's pretty much a Breath Breath of the Wild knockoff. But I just I fail to understand how a game that 
knocks off Breath of the Wild, one of the best games of all time, in my opinion, very well, just didn't get the traction that it I thought it would get. And I, I know people like this game, and it actually did review pretty well, but I don't think it did the sales numbers that Ubisoft had hoped for or that you might think if you were like, say, we're going to, just on paper, we're going to take Breath of the Wild, set it in, you know, ancient mythological, uh, you know, Greece or whatever, whatever <laughs> you want to call the setting. We're going to make it super colorful. You're going to be able to fly. You're going to be able to climb. You're going to have like some RPG mechanics, super cool monster design, some really quirky and interesting, at least in my opinion, writing. And then it just didn't seem to catch on. I don't, I don't, I don't understand. Yeah. Josh, do you think it's a general Ubisoft perception issue? Because I, I think that the general gaming community has almost a, I'm not even going to pay attention or give this game the time of day because Ubisoft makes it. I think that might have, I mean, I, I was going to say it must have something to do with it, but I don't know if I would say it with that much certainty. But okay. there is something where just, again, on paper, I thought that once they announced and revealed this game, it would just people would go nuts for it, but they didn't. And uh, maybe it is because it's Ubisoft. Because honestly, the the other game I was thinking of putting in this slot is Watch Dogs Legion. I think that's another really highly underrated game. And maybe that's because it's also a Watch Dogs game. And people feel like these games are formulaic. But I feel like Immortals and Watch Dogs Legion in particular both did a lot of things to break the the formulaic nature of Watch Dogs or of Ubisoft open world games. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I I have heard bad things about Watch Dogs. That that series may not uh, live to see the next game, but we'll see. I, I agree. I I don't think Watch Dogs, you know, will continue. That's my opinion. But right. Yeah, yeah man. Um. So for my next one, it's a, it's another open world game. Um. It's Sleeping Dogs. So wow. this yeah. is a game that I don't think a lot of people even played. Uh, sort of a unique take on the gta formula is the best comparison set in hong kong and um i just remember playing this game and being absolutely floored by the uh the melee combat and just all the unique ways it takes a formula that we were all very familiar with and doing its own thing um so i was always shocked that sleeping dogs 2 never happened um and I think there's a video on my channel if you want to listen to what I sounded like seven or so years ago, um, <laughs> where I where I talk about how amazing the game is and how it blows me away. But it, it reminds me of a more serious like Yakuza game, just just on the surface, right? Um, yeah. Sort of that more open world um, GTA style game. But uh, yeah, I loved Sleeping Dogs. I've heard a lot of people on YouTube talk about this game. So one of my kind of guilty pleasures on YouTube is I'll watch the like the sales videos, like when there's a sale on the PlayStation Store. Mm -hmm. people, these YouTubers will highlight the different games that are on sale. And uh, whenever, almost without fail, when Sleeping Dogs goes on sale, everybody is like, buy this game. It is so worth it. You need to check it out. <laughs> it's so good. If you're Yeah, if you're craving a different kind of open world game, go for it. It's awesome. Yeah. All right, so for my third answer, I have an I have an option. So Jackson, do you want to hear the the, the single game that I think is underrated or underappreciated, or do you want to hear my kind of like a, a cop out answer that? You know, I'm going to go for your cop out. All right, to uh, probably nobody's surprise, I am going with a uh, a genre, the stealth genre. Uh, I feel that this genre is, I mean, as everybody who listens to this podcast knows, I love stealth games. Uh, I've kind of discovered this love of stealth games relatively recently, but stealth games are kind of a rare breed nowadays in terms of purebred stealth games. You have games like Far Cry and Dishonored, where stealth is a big part of the gameplay, but uh, games like Hitman uh, just feel like, a, yeah, a rare breed. Anyways, I love the gameplay and I've been thinking a lot about why I like the gameplay so much, and part of it is that when I'm playing a stealth game, it's uh, it's it's kind of like constant suspense, not in a bad way. I'm not like racking my nerves the whole time, but stealth games have my attention like 99% of the time, whereas if I'm playing like an open world game, there might be a break in the action where I have to go from point A to point B, and it loses my attention a little bit. Or if I'm playing a uh, like a platformer, maybe there's a part that I'm just not excited about and it feels more like a chore to get through that. I, I just don't feel that when I'm playing these stealth games. So just, uh, I don't know if that 
gives you any insight. But I just feel that the genre overall, to the point of this conversation, is massively underrated and underappreciated. I'm right there with you. Um, I, I think it uh, doesn't play to um, the term. I'm forgetting the YouTuber who used it, but it's a goopy goblin gamer brain. It doesn't play to that. <laughs> um, it's not like, ah, shoot things, cut them up. I mean, it can be, but it's it's more, yeah, yeah. It, it requires 100% of your brain. Um, yeah. Which I, I like that about it too. And I would even extend your point to the immersive sim genre. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. That those games need more love. Yeah. Um, uh, so for my third one, um, I'm actually going to go with a Ninja Theory game. Came out in 2007. It's called Heavenly Sword. Um, yep. This is a third person hack and slash melee combat game um, that just like caption captured my imagination. It was uh, released in the early part of the PS3 life cycle. Um, so I don't know how many people even played it. Uh, cause the PS3, if you guys remember was $600 in 2007, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know what it was about this game. It, it really just, uh, I think it was visually stunning at the time. Um, but also I just love third person hack and slash kind of games and it had this like quick time, uh, bow and arrow gameplay where you could like shoot the bow and arrow and guide it around. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It had huge boss fights as well. Um, I just had a great time playing this game. This is another one that I've heard uh, some people on YouTube mention a number of times, and I never, I never played it, but uh, maybe it's one I should check out. It's definitely it's rough around the edges today. I went back and watched some gameplay while I was doing this list, and uh, it's rough. But if you're you're okay with that, then you should have a good time. Yeah, I am finding uh, with uh, my love for Bio Mutant and uh, you know some other double A games recently, rough around the edges is fine with me uh, if the game is solid. Uh, so I did want to have, I have one honorable mention. I know I, I said, I kind of gave you the choice to go with one or the other last time, but um, the last game on my list is, uh, uh, if you've listened to this podcast every episode anyway, you know I'm a big Tomb Raider fan. And Tomb Raider Underworld is a game, it's the last kind of old school traditional Tomb Raider game that came out before they remade the series. At least I think it is. And it's great. Like if you just want to explore big, uh, you know, ancient tombs in that kind of slower paced way that the old games did uh, it's a great game for that uh, beautiful for ps3 anyway it is a ps3 game so it's gonna look old by now or by today's standards but i love that game i definitely played this game um i don't remember too much specifics about it but i remember playing this game and really enjoying it i think i i know a lot of people and you yourself josh have said you you love the new version i think i just appreciate the more campy kind of older versions personally <laughs> I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I miss the old Tomb Raider a great deal. Uh, the original two on the PlayStation 1 are some of my most loved games of all time. I mean, I just love those games. But uh, I do like the new ones as well. Uh, I'm just a Tomb Raider fan all around. But if you like that old school Tomb Raider and you didn't play Underworld, it's actually really good. Awesome. Awesome, man. Um, I've got one uh, honorable mention as well. And it's actually going to a newer game. Came out a couple of years ago called Vampire. Um, yeah. This game feels double A. Like if you were going to say, give me a double A game, it was made by Don't Nod, which is very interesting, by the way. Yeah. Um, and it's basically a vampire RPG uh, where you go around and it does the classic RPG stuff, but it, but it actually leans more on like conversations and sort of talking your way through yeah. stuff. But you can be, it's got morality system. You can be a good vampire. I think you're a doctor, if I remember right, or a yeah. bad one. Um, lots of different combat that's actually pretty uh, intense. So if you're looking for a very offbeat RPG experience, look at Vampire. It's actually pretty awesome. Very cool. And maybe for people who were looking forward to Bloodlines, whatever it was called, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2, I think, which we may now not see ever. Who knows? Yeah. It's rough. Uh, that could be something to check out. Uh, well, cool. Uh, that is our deep dive discussion of the week. We are now going to take our second break. And when we get back, we will dig into our mailbag. And we're back. We are now going to wrap up the show by digging into our mailbag. If you want to hear your question read on the show next week, you can write into the email address preloadedpodcast at gmail.com. Or you can hit us up on Twitter. I am at 
Quest Mode Games on Twitter. Jackson, where can people find you? I am JV on YT. So, uh, yeah, send us your questions. We love reading them uh, every week. And this week, we got a question from BPR Gaming YT at BPR Gaming YT on Twitter. So, thanks for, uh, I think you responded to my, uh, my call for questions there. And you asked a very simple question uh, that is very timely as well. What's one major reveal you want to see at E3? Like, think of a batshit crazy reveal you want to happen. So, Jackson, what is one of those for you? So, this isn't completely out of left field because we know it's happening. Um, But mine is simply GTA 6. I think it's too early, uh, knowing Rockstar and how long they take to make games uh, and how much they polish. But GTA 6, if they reveal it, everyone's going to lose their mind. Yeah, if it weren't for Red Dead Redemption 2, I would say it's high time. But given that game came out not that long ago, I would be surprised to see GTA 6. But who knows? Yeah, it could happen. <laughs> yeah. And for me, the big one, I we did talk about this last week, but I would love for Microsoft to buy uh, Kojima Studios. And I'm not one to like really promote exclusivity and say like, oh, it, you know, uh, I know that that would maybe... Well, it definitely would upset some PlayStation fans, but I just feel like for some reason it feels right. And I would just love to see Phil Spencer, like what a move, what a power move that would be. Um, And to see their kind of attitude towards making games and, and, uh, you know, I feel like Xbox is making all the right moves. And if they gave Kojima uh, more than enough rope to use a uh, morbid metaphor, more than enough rope to hang himself with. I I think that would just be awesome to see what Kojima would come up with for Xbox. For sure. That would be really cool. Yeah. So anyways, uh, BPR Gaming YT, thank you very much for the question. Again, if you want to hear yours read on the uh, air or on the show next week, you can write to preloadedpodcast at gmail.com. And with that, we are going to wrap things up. Jackson, before we do, is there anything you want to uh, promote or plug on your channel? Yeah, just look up, uh, look out for uh, some Ubisoft-related stuff and Horizon news on my channel. Nice. And uh, I am working on a uh, Far Cry 6 video where I cover the uh, big things we know about stealth in that game. So I'm sticking with the stealth theme uh, in Far Cry 6. If that's something you're looking forward to, tune in. Should be posting between this show and next week's show. And with that... We are all done for the week. Thanks for sticking with us for the entire show. We will see you next week. Bye, guys.